Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, thrill to be here as the opening act for my friend Nena. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from her, but I hope you'll let me talk to you for a little bit in the meantime. Uh, I'm a little concerned because one of the members of the audience came up to me and said, you know, yesterday two out of the three talks were deeply dystopian. I hope you can be more hopeful. Uh, and the answer is I can be, but only about two-thirds of the way through the talk. Uh, so we've got to start in a sad place and sort of work our way there. Uh, but be patient with me and I promise we'll get there. But I want to start with a wonderful conversation I had a few weeks ago in Ghana, in West Africa. And I was hanging out with a bunch of internet activists and startup entrepreneurs, and I was really thrilled to meet the, these guys, especially the guy there in the red hat, whose name is Efo Dela. And I was excited to meet Efo because he'd been very involved with one of Ghana's most interesting political movements, which is a movement called Dumsor. Now, Dumsor is Chui for on and off. And if you're living in Ghana right now, that's what's happening with the power. It keeps going on and off. It will be off for as much as 12, 24, 36 hours at a time. And this is driving Ghanaians nuts because Ghana is really hot, like 40 C hot and 95% humidity. And Ghanaians are just like you and me. They don't like being uncomfortable. They don't like being sweaty. They don't like not being able to watch their favorite TV shows. And so Ghanaians are starting to take to the streets and organize marches and protests against these power outages. And Efo is one of the people who's been very involved with these protests. He's helped organize more than 5,000 people to march from the outskirts of town into the middle of Accra to protest Dumsor and to demand that the government do something. And so I said to him, Efo, what tools, what internet tools do you use for political mo mobilization in Ghana? And Efo looked at me and said, oh, man, I'm not political. I'm not political. Now, in a lot of countries I work in, when someone says, I'm not political, they mean, I don't want to get arrested. I don't want to get in trouble with the government. But that's not Ghana. Ghana is one of the most democratic and open societies on the planet. In fact, according to most indices, it's more democratic and has a freer press than the country that I come from, the United States. So that's not why Efo was worried about being known as being political. He was worried about being political because he was worried that everyone in that room would think that he was an idiot. Because that's what it means at this moment to be political in Ghana. To be associated with either of these political parties means that you're a dipshit and no one's going to take you seriously. And this is a really interesting problem. Efo is so down on politics in Ghana, he won't allow himself to be seen taking a photo with someone from either of these two political parties because he's afraid that if that photo goes on Twitter or on Facebook, people will think that he's a member of one of those parties and then half of Ghana won't listen to him anymore. Now this is interesting because this isn't just happening in Ghana. I'm hearing this around the world as I talk to young people, particularly people under 30. They tell me that they want to make change, but they want nothing to do with politics. And they're organizing around different issues. In India, they're usually organizing about corruption. In Nigeria, they're often organizing around electric power or government spending. In Russia, in many cases, they're organizing to try to provide services that they think the government should be providing, but isn't. They're actually going and providing relief services to people in, in some of the poorest areas of the country. So what's going on here? Well, in my country, what's going on is that people don't want to vote. You may be hearing that we're engaged in an 18-month election process, but the truth is we'll probably have very low voter turnout at the end of it. And when we're not having these presidential elections that are circuses, we have incredibly low voter turnout, and it's dropping year on year. And you know what? The same thing's starting to happen in Europe. People are voting less and less in European parliamentary elections. You've had a turnout of less than 50% for the first time in the history of those elections. And it's not just people failing to vote. 
it's people having very, very low levels of trust in the government that they have. Now, these are statistics from the United States. I suspect they are very, very different in Sweden. And I would love to talk with people about whether this diagnosis makes sense for Sweden. But in the United States, as recently as 1964, if you asked people, do they trust the government in Washington all or most of the time, 77% would say yes. As recently as 2011, that number was as low as 15%. In fact, during my lifetime, I'm not that old a guy, I'm only 42, but during my lifetime, there has only been one point where the majority of Americans thought that the government in Washington could be trusted, and it was the moment when we invaded Iraq, which just goes to show how dumb the American people can be. We don't just mistrust the government, we mistrust everybody. When you poll Americans and ask, do you trust banks, do you trust corporations, do you trust universities, do you trust libraries, anything that is an institution, we have learned to mistrust. And again, we're seeing some of the same trends in Europe, not across the board, but in many cases, European nations have a lower level of trust in government, corporations, and other major institutions than we do even in the United States. The people who tend to have high levels of trust are people in fairly closed societies, like China, United Arab Emirates, places without a whole lot of political freedoms. So here's the problem. Most of what we know how to do when we try to change the world and make it a better place is through politics. We mostly know, because we're mostly taught, that the way to make change is to elect good people, to pass good laws and to have society change in the ways that we want due to that system. But if we've reached a point where we have very little trust in politics and very little trust in institutions, what do we do next? Well, one of the things that people have tried to do is revolution. And in fact, it's been a very interesting few years for revolution. We saw with the Arab Spring lots of people trying to take to the streets and make change. And in fact, right now in the United States, we also have a wave of change around racism, structural racism in the United States, with people going into the streets and demanding that our police force in particular handle arrests of African Americans very, very differently. But this form of revolutionary change has actually been pretty challenging. It's been successful in Tunisia, it's been much less successful in Egypt, where we overthrew a government, but then have ended up with two subsequent overthrows. And in fact, in Libya and in Syria, to a certain extent in Yemen, we're still facing conflict that have come from these partial or failed revolutions. One of the things we've learned in Egypt is that when you oust a powerful government, whoever comes in is the next most powerful party. And so when the Mubarak government went down, you had the Muslim Brotherhood. And when the Muslim Brotherhood went down, you had the army. And a revolution where you trade one powerful but broken institution for another is not much of a successful revolution. Revolutions have had a lot more trouble taking political power once they've overthrown the power in question. The Indignados movement in Spain brought hundreds of thousands of people into the streets to protest inequality. But when they tried to go to the polls, their party, Podemos, only ended up with 8% of the electorate and very, very little representation. And the Occupy movement, while it inspired a lot of people, while it got people really excited about the notion of 99% of the people fighting against 1% of the people, has had almost no political and economic impact. So if you're depressed now, I have even worse news for you because it looks like there's good theories for why revolutions can't make change. This is my friend Zeynep Tufeshi. She's one of the best sociologists working in the world right now. She's from Turkey and some of her best work has focused on understanding what went on in the Gezi Park protests. And Gezi Park brought tens of thousands of people out to protest Erdogan. But shortly after that, Erdogan got reelected with a huge majority. So how do we explain this? How do we explain people coming out into the streets, but then most of the electorate doing something entirely different? 
And her theory on this is that the internet is helping us build social movements that are incredibly broad. They involve everybody. In fact, the motto for Gezi Park protests was send a gal, you come to. No matter who you are, no matter what you have against the government, come out into the streets. And so you had a movement that had gay and lesbian Turks, it had ultra-nationalists, it had Islamists, it had Kurds, it had people who literally would not speak to one another coming together in the park. And when the protests ended in the park, those people still couldn't speak to one another. And they couldn't build a movement, they couldn't make lasting, meaningful change. And Zeynep fears that this is going to happen a lot because the internet has made it so much easier to bring people out into the streets that we don't have to do that work ahead of time to get people to talk to each other and to settle their differences. And if you want depressing, we can move over to Bulgaria where my friend Ivan Krasjev has a theory that even if these movements, even if Indignados, even if Occupy manage to put very different people in power, we're still largely powerless through politics to change the really deep structures of our economy. Even if Spain wanted to get rid of austerity, they can't do it because the global economy will punish them so badly for trying to make that change that it will end up failing. So what do you do? If you don't trust institutions in making change through them, if revolution looks dangerous and ineffective, we're left with this question of efficacy. How can you actually go out and try to make lasting change in the world today? Here's one of the things that gives me hope. My friend Larry Lessig wrote a book in 2000 called Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. And he meant this as a lesson in how people regulate new technologies. We can make technologies legal or illegal. We can make them cheap or expensive. We can lock down the code so that you can't do certain things. You can't rip the DVD in your laptop. We have social norms that say that certain things are acceptable or unacceptable. And these are all ways that we control technologies for better or for worse. The interesting thing about this is that these are all tools for political action and mobilization. You can use any of these methods to try to figure out how to make change in the world. So I want to start by talking about change through norms. And I'm sorry that he's not here today, but my friend Evgeny Morozov, who spoke to you yesterday, is very famous for making a critique of slacktivism. And his idea behind slacktivism is that people want to make change, but they move online, and what they do is meaningless. It doesn't actually help. It doesn't push things forward. And I think that's often a helpful critique, but I also think it's often very unfair. Because I think what people are often trying to do online is not pass a law or elect someone. They're trying to change people's minds. They're trying to change their attitudes. And this is what we call norms-based change. We're trying to change how people think and feel. And right now in the United States, there's a huge need for this around race. Because the problems that we're having, where we have police officers shooting young men of color, this isn't a matter of law. It's been illegal to shoot people for a long time. But what's happening is that those racist attitudes need to change. And having people challenge those, whether it's online or offline, is deeply important. So here's a story that happened early in the Black Lives Matter movement. We had the shooting last summer of this young man, Michael Brown. And when he was shot, media outlets started portraying him with that image over there. It's shot from below, so he looks very tall. He's showing a peace sign, but many of the, the, the newspapers reported this as a gang sign. And this was an image that in many ways was guaranteed to make this young man look dangerous. And so activists went onto his Facebook page where they'd found that first image and said, why didn't you use this other image? This other image makes him look like what he was, which is a child. And when you look at that image, you realize the crime that happened, which is that the police shot a child. And so activists started tweeting this phrase, if they gunned me down, what picture would they use? 
if I were killed by the police, how would I be portrayed in the media? And people started taking pictures from their own Facebook feeds, one where they would look like a bad guy, and one where they would look like someone that everyone would be proud of. And people started posting these and putting these on things like Tumblr, and over the course of three days, thousands of these went online. And within three days, the New York Times, probably the most influential newspaper in the country, ran a story about this. And what was very interesting is that you didn't see that first image of Michael Brown anymore. No one used that image anymore. They realized, news outlets realized, that how you choose to portray people is critically important around these issues of social norms. Now we see norms-based activism in all sorts of different spaces. I realize the refugee issue is an incredibly controversial one here in Sweden today, but part of what's going on in these photos from Germany is very much a norms-based theory of change. Football clubs going out and saying, look, we don't want to see these people as other, we want to see them as people who we might decide. So there's other theories of change outside the political. You guys are no doubt aware that my country is very interested in what you're doing. In fact, we seem to be very interested in everybody right now. This is why we're trying so hard to listen to you. Uh, th this, is, this is the NSA controversy, and this is something that as an American who travels around the world is incredibly, incredibly frustrating and embarrassing. And it's frustrating and embarrassing that under our current president, we don't seem to be making any changes in these policies where we're asserting a right to listen to everybody on the planet. And since we're not going to be able to change this through law, maybe we have to find a way to change it through code. And we start seeing projects like Tor, and like PGP encryption, and like uh, uh, the, the silent, um, silent circle messaging, and, and Signal, all these different technologies that are looking for ways to say, even if we can't make change via law, maybe we can make change through other means. Maybe we can make change through the code. We're even seeing people try to make progress on otherwise intractable issues by building businesses and trying to make change in the marketplace. There hasn't been nearly as much progress as there needs to be globally around climate change. And this is why it's very interesting to see a company like Tesla say, look, we're going to build one of the most fashionable, one of the most exciting automobiles in the world that just happens to be an electric car. It just happens to be a really interesting statement about climate change, but it also happens to be something that's highly desirable and that people are going to want in the market. Now the problem with all of these theories of change is that they're taking place in the sphere that people talk about as disruption. Of people coming in and trying to take existing systems and toss them up into the air and make a great deal of money by changing them. There's nothing wrong with disruption. There's a lot that's wrong in the world that deserves to be disrupted at this moment in time. But there's a real question about who gets to be disruptive. And right now, most of the people who are being disruptive are people with a great deal of privilege and a great deal of money. They're people with venture capital backing and very good educations. And one of the really interesting questions, if you're looking through change, through norms, through code, through markets, is how do we make this broad and inclusive? How do we make it possible for everybody in the world to get involved in trying to make these changes? Now, if these systems are trying to build new types of institutions to replace the ones that we don't trust anymore, some of the most radical thinkers out there are trying to imagine a future with no institutions. That's the future that the people behind Bitcoin are imagining, where they're basically saying, what if we had a future where there are no banks, there's no central points of control over the monetary system, and it's not just that no one has their hand on the controls. Literally, within that system, there is no way to make that, that sort of change. There is no way to seize control of the system. It's a very noble concept. It's a very radical idea. The bad news is that so far, no one's figured out how to do it. We've tried things like mesh networks. We've tried things like the Freedom Box, an attempt to sort of take the web and decentralize it so that everyone is running a web server. 
And so far, we don't know how to make it work. This doesn't mean that it can't work. And for me, something like Bitcoin is not so much interesting as a currency as it's interesting as a political philosophy. It's interesting as a way of saying to a world where we don't trust any central institutions, can we find a way to live without them? But for me, in many ways, the most exciting pathway around this is not just building new institutions, not looking for a world without institutions, but trying to figure out how we take control and ownership back of these institutions that we don't trust at this moment in time. How do we go from having institutions that we don't trust to institutions that are ours, that we feel like we have some control over? So here's a friend of mine, Luigi Reggi. He works for the Italian government, and he was involved with one of the most beautiful data visualizations I've ever seen, which was Open Cohesion. The idea behind this was this was a way of visualizing where EU cohesion funds were being spent in Italy. And Luigi's theory behind this was if people could just see how this EU money was being spent in their community, everyone would feel much more positive, much more excited about it. And like most open data projects, it was well done, it was beautiful, and absolutely no one looked at it. And so he decided we needed a different approach to this. And so he took the model of the hackathon. And hackathons are great if you happen to be a hacker. They're not so good if you don't know how to program. And he said, well, could we have a hackathon that's open to everyone, that's open to people whether or not you could program, and we'll make it a monothon. We'll take on monitoring, and we'll go out and do it together. And so using high school students from all over Italy, he's been going out and visiting these EU-funded projects, and they do this very rigorous work to try to figure out, was this project any good or not? Was it a success? Do people like it? Do they end up using it? This is a beautiful model of taking that skepticism, taking that mistrust, and turning it into something positive and finding out that a lot of the time these things actually work. I like this idea enough that I've stolen it and I'm trying to use it now in Brazil with a project that we call Promise Tracker. And this is a whole new platform. In Promise Tracker, you go onto the web, you design a data collection survey. It can have photos, it can have videos, it can have sensor readings, and you go out into your neighborhood somewhere in Sao Paulo and you pick an issue that you care about. Maybe you care about sidewalks. Maybe you care about potholes in the streets. Maybe you care about parks so that your children can have a place to play. You can collect data and you can share that data collection application with everyone in your circle of friends or everyone in your group or everyone in your neighborhood. And together you can monitor and say to the government, you're not giving us what you promised. You're not giving us what we needed. We need you to do better. This is a form of something that people call surveillance. Surveillance is not surveillance watching from atop, it's watching from below. It's when we get together and we turn our phones and we turn our attention to the powerful people in our lives and we ask a question, are we getting what we need and what we want? And this is a very old and very powerful form of activism. When the Black Panthers, the radical black power movement in the United States in the 1960s started up, they started by following the police around and watching them as they arrested black people to make sure that there was no police brutality. And the same movement is now taking shape again with movements like Cop Watch in the United States where people follow the police and they assert their right to make sure they're doing the right thing by holding up their mobile phone and monitoring what's going on. So I do have hope, and I have hope in three things. I have hope that we're going to build new institutions. I have hope that people are going to find ways to govern without institutions. I have hope that we're going to find ways to take ownership and take leadership over our institutions. What we have to fight against is letting this mistrust lead to disengagement. Mistrust can be deeply corrosive. If we don't believe in the government, the most likely thing for us to do is to disengage and forget about it and pay attention to our own lives. And what we have to do instead is try to find a way to harness this mistrust, 
to take this frustration that so many people are feeling with the world today and put it towards something productive and possible. And, and that's what I'm working on, and I, I hope that you'll get in touch with me, talk with me about it. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you very Thank much, you very much for a very inspiring talk. Thanks. Um, what do you think is going to happen when the establishment, let's say in the United States, the political parties, they are the ones who start to create their own sort of grassroots movements. I, I would argue that we've seen this uh, arguably, with, especially with the Democratic Party, who are taking to the streets and doing a lot of door-to-door uh, -door and a lot of activist sort of movement, but it's actually more of a, a, a party-funded, party-organized uh, movement. How do, we, how do we tell this apart when the establishment yeah. is trying to mimic a grassroots movement? So I think that's right, and I think in the US at least, people have been trying to harness this grassroots energy since at least 2004. And what I see happening now is that people are actually starting to lose faith in that. Um, I, I'm fairly far on the left in the US. We all accept that Hillary Clinton is probably going to be our nominee. At the same time, she's been a hawk, she's terrible on Israel, she's connected to the banks, and people are having a very tough time getting excited. Um, the actual momentum is for a real leftist with Bernie Sanders who probably won't get elected. And I think a lot of people are looking at this and saying, this isn't real. Um, this is all scripted. We have very little power over this. The reason I'm talking about methods like this and different ways that people are trying to make change is I think people are really starting to lose faith in making change through those established methods. Yeah, and, and when people do lose uh, faith in the voting system, can we expect more? Will there be emergence of third parties like you were mentioning in, in Spain? And is that going to happen maybe in the US as well? In the US so far, where this is happening is around much smaller spaces. So we've seen protests at the city level in cities like Baltimore. We also see it right now on university campuses. And when people are trying to change their university policies, this is a way of saying, I think the whole country is too big for me to try to change, but maybe I can change this much smaller thing. And I think that's what people are looking for right now. People are looking to feel powerful, to feel like they can make any sort of change in the world, even if it's as on a small scale as a university. Yeah, dig, dig where you stand. You got it. Okay. Thank you so much Thanks for a so very much. inspiring Thank you very talk. Much. Thanks a lot. And before uh, you leave, we have uh, to show our appreciation. We have a small gift for you that we show on the screen. It has a story. We at the Internet Foundation in Sweden love makers and believe that knowledge provides new possibilities. A few months ago, a young maker got arrested for taking his home built clock to school. This is not how the world should be. So we let a bunch of 14 year olds build their own clocks as gifts for our keynote speakers. Young minds like this strengthen our belief that the internet should be both free and open for all. Yes, so welcome on stage, Rickard Dahlstrand. <laughs> With your own personal Thank you. clock. Thank you. As a symbol, as a token of our appreciation and uh, for the internet of the future. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. Sackman. Thank you very much. Very beautiful. Thank you, Thank you so much.